Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome very much to the third. Have a seat. I'll wait for you have a seat. To the third of the Einstein at Rockman um, talks is a collaborative effort between the Department of Philosophy, the Rockman Institute of Philosophy, and the London Public Library. Um, Coming up, we've got, we've got a few more. Um, next week is me, then Chris Meek, and um, there will also be a Einstein art exhibit um, at, at um, the Satellite Art Gallery. Tonight, we have a very, we're very honored to have a distinguished visitor from the University of Waterloo, Doreen Fraser, and she's going to talk about Einstein and quantum mechanics. <laughs> All right, good evening everyone, and thank you for coming out on a night where I'm competing with the Blue Jays in a very important elimination game. I appreciate you coming out to hear about Einstein. Um, as uh, Wayne just mentioned, uh, I'm a professor of philosophy uh, from the University of Waterloo, and I'm also a member of the Rotman Institute here at the University of Western Ontario. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to uh, be here today to tell you about Einstein, God, dice and quantum mechanics. So hopefully the title will be crystal clear to you by the time I get to the end of the talk. Um, before I uh, tell you about uh, what Einstein thought about uh, quantum mechanics, I, I'm going to take a couple minutes to uh, step back and uh, situate what I'm going to talk about tonight and focus on specifically in uh, the context of uh, Einstein's uh, uh, life as a whole. Um, so Einstein is perhaps best known for two very important theories that he was the author of, primarily responsible for, the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. Um, he also, as you will get an appreciation for if you attend the other lectures in this series, made many, many, many other contributions to other areas uh, of physics. And in fact, what he won the Nobel Prize for in 1921 was for, not for one of the theories of relativity at all, but for the photoelectric effect, which is the basis for the technology that's used today in solar panels. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on what Einstein thought about quantum mechanics. And that is something that he got more, perhaps more and more puzzled by as he got older. Uh, so I'm going to be zeroing in on what he thought about quantum mechanics and what he expressed in an important paper he published in 1935. Um, what I'd like you to notice here is that he made a lot of very important discoveries early in his life before he got to that point. So there are going to be two Einsteins that are going to feature in this talk. One of them is the young Einstein who made all of these superstar discoveries and who had already won a Nobel Prize by 1921. And the other Einstein that's going to feature in this talk is this Einstein, the one who, 1935 and later, was becoming increasingly puzzled about uh, quantum mechanics. So, when he was writing about quantum mechanics, when he was writing about quantum mechanics, um, it was a still a very new theory. So it was really only by 1927 that the theory had gotten on the table. So when he's writing about it in 1935, that's relatively soon after the theory had first been presented to the community of physicists. So. This will probably seem familiar to you. This is the young Einstein and what some of his colleagues had to say about him. And now I have, in complete honesty, I have to tell you that these quotes I'm drawing from reference letters for Einstein. So we all know that reference letters might not be the most, the place you go to find the most accurate comments about somebody, but still, I think they speak, uh, speak volumes here. What I admire in him in particular is the facility with which he adapts himself to new concepts and knows how to draw from them every conclusion. So this is what Poincaré, uh, physicist and mathematician, said in 1911. Uh, in 1913, uh, Planck and other physicists got together and wrote a reference letter, and here is what they said about him. Apart from his own productivity, Einstein has a peculiar talent 
for probing alien original views and premises, and from his experience judging their interrelationship with uncanny certainty. Okay, so this is high praise. Compare to what his colleagues had to say about uh, what I'll call for the moment the old Einstein. I'm going to move in a minute to talking about Einstein in his later years, but uh, for simplicity here, uh, this is what uh, the Einstein later on in his career uh, attracted by way of comments. So Heisenberg, uh, one of the physicists who uh, won a Nobel Prize for uh, creating quantum theory, um, says this. Most scientists are willing to accept new empirical data and to recognize new results, provided they fit into their philosophical framework. But in the course of scientific progress, it can happen that a new range of empirical data can be completely understood only when the enormous effort is made to enlarge this framework and to change the very structure of the thought process. In the case of quantum mechanics, Einstein was apparently no longer willing to take this step or perhaps no longer able to do so. Okay, so Einstein is not willing to take the step of changing the structure of his thought process when he's confronted with quantum mechanics. Here's another, and so uh, Heisenberg, it's fair to say, had many disagreements with Einstein over quantum mechanics over the course of their careers. Um, so you might think that he's writing after Einstein died. Uh, perhaps there's a bit of uh, uh, animosity still there. Uh, that's not the case for the next uh, author here, who is uh, Max Born, who also made very important contributions to quantum mechanics, and who was a friend of Einstein's throughout his life. Here's what Born says. At first, there were quite a number of serious scientists who did not want to know anything about the theory of relativity, conservative individuals who were unable to free their minds from the prevailing philosophical principles. Einstein himself belonged to this group in later years. He could, not lo he could no longer take certain new ideas in physics which contradicted his own firmly held philosophical convictions. Okay, so again, you're getting the same picture painted of Einstein as someone who in his, his later life is not able to accept the novel revolutionary ideas that quantum mechanics is putting forward. Okay, so we have, as I was saying before, this tale of the two Einsteins. We have the young Einstein who everybody praises as being brilliant, in particular being brilliant for recognizing the new concepts of space-time that were needed for the theories of relativity. And then on the other hand, you have the old Einstein, who his colleagues say is the very opposite, is someone who's not able to recognize the new concepts that quantum mechanics is putting forward. Okay, so to frame my talk, I have two questions that I'd like to answer tonight. Um, so the, the first, I, I presented to you the picture of Einstein that's painted by his colleagues. And of course, the first thing we have to do when we're looking at history is we have to ask ourselves whether that's an accurate picture of the way Einstein actually thought or not. So the first question I have is, did Einstein really become unwilling to accept the new ideas of quantum mechanics in his later years? Is that really what was going on? Um, and so in order to answer that question, we have to back up a step and consider what Einstein really did think about quantum mechanics. So we're going to start with this, with this second question. Uh, before I, I, I uh, have to let Einstein speak, so this is an Einstein talk, um, so I want to make sure that Einstein has every opportunity here to, uh, to defend himself and to tell us what he thinks about the work he's doing. So this is what Einstein has to say about the critics of his later years. Even the great initial success of the quantum theory does not make me believe in the fundamental dice game, although I'm very well aware that our younger colleagues interpret this as a consequence of senility. <laughs> Okay, so Einstein was also very much aware that, he, he, well, he characterizes them as younger colleagues, but some of the quotes I gave you were from his contemporaries, right? So Einstein's aware of what's going on, um, but still he sticks to his guns. And his guns are that he does not believe that quantum mechanics can be a fundamental dice game. Okay, so what does he mean by that? The metaphor that I'm going to be talking about tonight is the metaphor of on the one side, playing dice and what that means. And on the other side is a metaphor um, of God and what God thinks the universe is about. Uh, so this is a metaphor that Einstein used over the course of several decades when he was talking about quantum mechanics. So in the quote I just gave you from 1944, and here we have a quote very early from, from 1926. 
Um, so I'm going to focus on this quote, and I'm going to unpack this metaphor uh, of God and dice that, quantum, that Einstein's using to talk about quantum mechanics. So Einstein says, quantum mechanics is very worthy of regard. But an inner voice tells me that this is, sorry, I'm missing letters, words here. This is not yet the right track. The theory yields much, but it hardly brings us closer to the old one's secrets. I, in any case, am convinced that he does not play dice. Okay, so unpacking what Einstein is saying about quantum mechanics there. The first point that he makes is the point that's important to bear in mind, which is that quantum mechanics is very worthy of regard. So Einstein thinks that quantum mechanics is a big achievement, that uh, it's an achievement that's to be respected, and he, doesn't, um, and he doesn't want to diminish that achievement that has been made by his colleagues who formulated quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is, was very worthy of regard, primarily because it was very successful and has continued to be very successful at making accurate predictions about the outcomes of experiments. Okay, so this is what Einstein is recognizing when he's making this, uh, this comment. So it's important to bear in mind as we're trying to figure out what Einstein thinks about quantum mechanics, that Einstein isn't questioning the predictions that quantum mechanics makes. He's not suggesting that the predictions that quantum mechanics makes are not accurate. Um, what he's questioning is whether quantum mechanics as a theory is able to fully explain the predictions that it's making. So um, I forgot to say at the beginning of the talk that I'm a philo well, I said I'm a philosopher, but uh, more specifically, I'm a philosopher of physics and a, and a historian of physics. So these questions here about how to explain the predictions are exactly the sorts of questions that I'm interested in uh, as a philosopher. So we'll see this is where Einstein wanted to engage with the, the theory as well. Okay, so let's, having put that on the table, then look at the interesting part of this quote. Uh, the part that's about the dice and the part that's about God. So <clears throat> think about, first of all, the part about playing dice. Uh, so Einstein uh, has in mind what you might think of if you went to Vegas and were playing dice, or what you might think of if, you were, uh, if you're playing snakes and ladders and you're playing a game with dice. Um, so if you think about uh, the principle of playing any type of game of chance with dice, um, the basic principle is if you throw one die, and if six is a thing you particularly want, let's say, then as long as it's a fair die and there's a fair mechanism for throwing it, then the chance of getting a six when you throw your die is one in six. Okay. So this is an important principle for playing any type of game with dice. Um, so why do games with dice work? They work because the players who are playing the games and the casino operators, as long as they're not doing anything fishy with the dice, Nobody can know anything more precise about whether a particular die is going to land on a six on a particular roll than that there's a one in six chance. Okay, so that's what makes games of chance exciting, be they games at casinos or uh, snakes and ladders. Um, so Einstein thinks that quantum mechanics can't be like this. So let's think about for a moment what it would be like if God were playing any kind of game which involved dice. So it wouldn't be very interesting for God to play games with dice um, because presumably God would know in advance whether when he throws the dice, it's going to land on a six or not. So that takes all of the fun out of any of the games of chance that you would play with the dice. So what this means is that since God knows what it's gonna, what, which uh, number the dice is going to land on, God does not only know the chance one in six, God knows that it's a six, or he knows it's going to be a five or a one. So Einstein, in this quote, is what he's trying to convey, essentially, is just that he thinks that physics should work more like God playing dice than it should work like somebody uh, playing a game of chance with dice. So what Einstein believes is that theories in physics should, assuming it's, this is possible, tell us the same information that God has. So 
A theory in physics should not merely tell us the chance that an object has a certain property or that an event is going to turn out a certain way. Uh, physics should tell us whether or not the object actually has the property or not. Okay, so that, that's what Einstein is wanting out of his physics. So I had an important qualification there, which is that if it's possible, we are going to want our physical theories to do this for us. Um, so uh, what Einstein did in uh, 1935 is to look into this exactly, exact question. Uh, so he asked himself, when quantum mechanics describes only chances, when it tells us only probabilities that something is going to occur, is it possible to give a more complete description of what is actually happening? And not just the probabilities of it being one in six chance, but whether it's actually a six or not. And so this is what he considered in a, an important paper that he wrote in 1935. Can quantum mechanical description of reality be considered complete? Uh, with his co-authors, uh, Podolsky and Rosette. So the answer that Einstein uh, gives to the question in the paper, uh, can the quantum mechanical description of reality be considered complete, is no. There's something that's missing from quantum mechanics. So his goal in the paper uh, is not just to say that it's his opinion that it can't, uh, that quantum mechanics is, in, is, is not complete, but to give a good argument that quantum mechanics is not complete. And the way he goes about doing this is by presenting an experiment that uh, is an experiment that quantum mechanics says should be possible to do. So his goal was to use an experiment to show that quantum mechanics only describes the chances of a particle having a particular property, a quantum system having a, a particular property, when it should describe which property the particle actually has. Okay, so he uses the exper experiment to show that what quantum mechanics gives us is what you get from a game of chance in a casino or snakes and ladders, but uh, really what you could expect from an account of the world uh, is to know what, whether the die lands on six or not, okay? Um, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through a version of this experiment. Um, this is a really important paper, so there've been a number of versions of this experiment that different people have thought of. So I'm gonna pick a particularly simple one the important thing for you to know is that everything I'm telling you is in principle possible to do with an experiment in quantum mechanics and that a version of this experiment has actually been done. Okay, so I'm gonna present a, a simple version to get the point across, but everything I'm talking about here could, could be done. Okay, so we're gonna set up this experiment in steps. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to get two particles. So the two particles are, they could be two electrons, say. But we'll just tell them two particles. The important thing is they're very, very small. So quant quantum mechanics is going to have to apply to describe them. We're going to get our two particles together, and we're going to get them to interact in some way. Okay? So they're going to be affecting each other. They're going to be entangled. After we do that, they're going to stop interacting. They're going to stop being entangled together at a certain point, and they're going to shoot off in different directions. So we're going to have one go to the left and one go to the right. It's an experiment, right? So we're going to have to do some type of measuring. Uh, so we're going to measure with this quantum detector that we have here. And so we're going to do measurements on our left particle. So you notice that the, um, sorry, that the, uh, the, the, the detector that we have has three numbers on it, one, two, and three. And it has this switch. So what the numbers represent and the switch represents is a choice we can make about which experiment we're going to do. So actually, we have a, a super duper detector, which can not only do one type of experiment, but it can do three different types of experiments. Okay, so. If there, there are three different properties of some type, say if it's quantum mechanics, it'd be something like spin that this, uh, that this particle can have, then there's three different, uh, three different types of properties we can measure. All right, so we can choose. We can make it one, we can make it three. And so when the particle goes into our detector, 
Um, we're going to know what property it has because there's two lights on our detector. Okay, so the green light means it has the green property, and the red light means that it has the red property. Okay, so this is going to make it really easy for us when we're doing our experiment. To, if we're uh, doing this in a, sci in a science lab, we'd presumably have a computer hooked up to this thing, or we'd have a notebook, and we're going to record all the colors of lights that the detector, the detector flashes. Okay, so now we're all set up. The next step, once we've got this great experiment together in our lab, is we're going to have to go to the theory of quantum mechanics, and we're going to have to figure out what quantum mechanics is predicting about our system. Because what we're going to want to do is, is, is test and see whether quantum mechanics is giving us the right predictions. OK, so for this particular system I've, I've um, set up here and that Einstein is considering, uh, quantum mechanics is going to make uh, two predictions. So it's going to make predictions for the particle on the left that we have our device measuring. So there's a one in two chance that the particle is going to be red, and there's a one in two chance that it's going to, that it's going to be green when we look at what the result of the measurement is. And it's just the same thing for the particle on the right. So there's a one in two chance that the particle on the right could be red, and there's a one in two chance that it will be green. Okay, so this is where the chances come into quantum mechanics like in the dice game. Okay, the quantum mechanics isn't telling us when we, our particle goes into the machine whether it's going to be red or whether it's going to be green. You only know that there's a 50-50 chance either way. There's a one in two chance. OK, so here's the thing that's going to make everything a little bit more interesting. The thing that's going to make things a little bit more interesting is the particular system that Einstein picks has another very special property. It has the property that if the particle on the left is red, then the, prop, then the, pro, then the uh, particle on the right is going to be green when we measure property one. Uh, and it works vice versa as well. So if we're uh, doing our measurement on the left and the pro property one turns out to be green, then it's going to be certain that the particle on the right is red. Okay, so they're going to be, they're going to have opposite properties. Um, still, the chances are going to be 50-50% because any time we uh, do, on any given run of the experiment, we're not going to know which way it's going to be. We just know it's going to be opposite each time. Okay, so now we are almost ready to run our experiment. There's another important consideration that Einstein takes into account. Um, so. We're going to be interested in thinking about the left particle and the right particle. Um, so we're going to specify where we're going to do the experiment. So of course, we care about the left particle. So we're going to do this experiment on Earth in this room in London, Ontario. And we're going to, quantum mechanics doesn't care where you put the other particle. Okay? So to make it particularly interesting, say that when we do this experiment on Earth, this other particle is on the move. Okay, it doesn't matter where it is as long as it's really, really far away. All right, so we're doing our experiments here on Earth. Let's run this machine and see what happens. Okay, so the first detection we get, uh, our particle on the Earth goes through our machine and property one is red. Okay, so that is giving us one piece of information. It's giving us automatically another piece of information. Right? Because I said that the two particles, or the, the two particles always have opposite properties. Right? So if we, we know that if our particle here on Earth in this room has uh, property red, then the one on the moon has property green okay? automatically because they always have opposite properties. OK, let's try this again. All right, the second time we do it, you know, there's a 50-50 chance you can get either thing. The second time we do it, it happens to come out green. All right, so that tells us one piece of information about our particle here on Earth, that it's green. But then we automatically know, without checking at all, that the particle on the moon is, has property red. OK. We could do that with other properties. Uh, since we have the super duper machine that does three different experiments in one, same thing happens if we, do, if we decide to switch our switch. And instead of checking what's going on with property one, we're going to check what's going on with property three. Okay, so in this case, we get property three turning out to be green. And then we automatically know that property three 
is red as well. Okay, so that's what happens when we run Einstein's experiment. Here is what Einstein does with that experiment. So the conclusion he draws is based on a criterion he introduces, which he calls his criterion of reality. Okay, so he's not just interested in what kinds of predictions and what the probabilities are. He's interested in what this experiment is telling him about the world, what reality is really like out there in the world. So here's his criterion. If without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, okay, so he's going to be very specific here. Certainty means probability equal to unity, one, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. Okay, so he says, this is going to be the assumption I have about what reality is like. Let's see what happens when you apply his assumption to, uh, to the quantum experiment. When you apply his assumption to the quantum experiment, um, th this is going to tell us that, of course, we know that our particle here on Earth has green property 3. But we are also know without checking that the particle on the moon has red property three. Okay, so we're giving, we have two elements of reality as Einstein would put it, or just we know that after we do that one experiment, these two particles, one of them is green and one of them is red. Okay, so remember that in order to apply the uh, criteria of reality, it was important that if you disturb the system, um, then you couldn't, you couldn't infer anymore that the thing that you were measuring had that property before you measured it. Okay, so um, this was why we were thinking about one system on Earth and another system on the Moon. Okay, so we infer the straightforward case is when we do this experiment and it comes out green, we infer that we did a measurement and the particle on the left was green. And that's what we're discovering when we do this detection measurement, do the experiment. Um, so what we're inferring is that the property on the moon that we're doing nothing to whatsoever, there's not even a detection device on the moon, we're going to assume that, well, well we're going to assume that nobody uh, who's been to the moon left any kind of detection devices up there to do this kind of experiment. So there's not even any type of instrument we could use to do any detection on the moon. Um, so we're, we're not looking at it or anything. So that because we're so far away, we're assuming that when we do our measurement here, Nothing we do here on Earth in this room is in any way affecting this particle that is out there on the moon. Okay, so that means that, according to Einstein's criteria, we can um, conclude that the particle on the moon is red. All right. So, here's the punchline. The conclusion that he draws from this is the conclusion that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Okay, so remember that what quantum mechanics was telling us by way of predictions was that there's a one in two chance that the particle on the moon is red and there's a one in two chance that the particle on the moon is green. But after I do my experiment on, we do our experiment here on Earth, then we know that actually the particle on the moon is red. Okay, so Einstein says, look, Quantum mechanics isn't giving us the full set of information. It's not giving us a complete description of the situation. It's only telling us that we don't know whether the particle on the moon is red or green. Uh, there's a 50-50 chance either way. Whereas we know perfectly well that, once we apply Einstein's criteria, we know perfectly well that the particle on the moon is genuinely red. Okay, so, the, uh, so Einstein concludes Quantum mechanics is giving us an incomplete description. Okay, so now I'm getting back to the dice and God. Right, so what Einstein is saying is that quantum mechanics is like the game of chance with dice. Okay, so, so the way quantum mechanics works is it gives you probabilities, like one in six, that the, the die is going to be six. It's giving you probabilities, chances one in two, that the particle is going to be red or green. That's a problem, says Einstein, because what we really want is a theory that is like God's dice. So remember, when God's playing dice, it's boring, right? Because God knows what's going to happen when he, throws the, when he throws that die. He knows it's going to be a six. Um, so he doesn't have chances like in, like in quantum mechanics. 
Um, so Einstein says, look, quantum mechanics is like this too. Um, and what he concludes from this is we need to find another theory um, that is more like what it's like when God's playing dice, when you have, uh, when the theory tells you what actually is the case in every circumstance, instead of a theory that's just telling you there's a one in two chance it's going to be red and a one in two chance that it's going to be green. Okay, so this is what Einstein is, um, is making the case for in this paper. All right, so here's the, the quote again. Quantum mechanics is very worthy of regard, but an inner voice tells me that this is not yet the right track. The theory yields much, but it hardly brings us closer to the old one's secrets. Surely the old one knows whether that the particle on the moon is red, right? Uh, I, in any case, am convinced that he does not play dice. God would not be satisfied with a theory that merely gave you chances and didn't tell you whether it's red or green. Okay, so here's another interesting dice quote that I really like that Einstein made on another occasion. So this is a little bit later, in 1942. It seems hard to sneak a look at God's cards. Okay, so you see again, he's really interested in the analogy to games of chance. But that he plays dice and uses telepathic methods, as the present quantum theory requires of him, is something that I cannot believe for a single moment. Okay, so here we're learning that not only does God not play dice, because he knows the answers, but God's not going to use telepathy anyway, either. Okay. So let's see how that applies in this experiment. OK, so what would it mean for God to be telepathic? OK, so let's think about our particle on the moon. And let's just assume God's everywhere. So God is on the moon with our particle, even though we haven't put any type of detection device or anything on the moon. So, um, so if God was uh, telepathic, God would determine uh, the property of the particle on the moon uh, at the same instant we detect property one of the particle on Earth. Okay, so that would be what it would mean for God to be telepathic. Okay, so here's the picture. Um, so here's the before picture. So before the particle enters our detector, and now we're just assuming that God only knows what quantum mechanics tells him. Okay, so if God only knows what quantum mechanics tells him, God only knows that before the particle enters our detector over here, there's a one in two chance it's going to be red, and there's one in two chance it's going to be green. And the same thing for his particle that he's paying special attention to on the moon. OK, so what's important here, uh, I'm going to flag, because I'm going to do something a little bit different with this experiment. So notice here that neither particle has a color, because we don't know, right? God doesn't even know. God doesn't know whether it's red or green. There's still a 50-50 chance either way. OK. so. I want everybody paying attention because the next thing is going to happen very fast. Okay. Are you ready? All right. I'm going to do it again because it was so it was so fast as to be instantaneous. Okay. So there's the before picture. There's the after picture after the particle goes into our detector. What happened in the after picture? This is the audience participation. What, what happened in the after picture? Um, that red, the other red, and before there's a black. That's right. Yes. It, it interferes with Saturn, and sometimes it's it's an interference Okay, good. So that's so that's going beyond where I'm going to go here. But that yeah, so that's what the kind of ex explanation you get from quantum mechanics would be in terms of an interference pattern. Okay, so, so you're right. The simple answer is just that they're nothing, right? They have no color whatsoever. And then as soon as my, det our detector here on Earth flashes red, the other one on the moon turns green. Okay, so um, Einstein's point is that this picture doesn't make any sense, right? Remember, we're doing this from a God's eye view. So God, Einstein says, can't be in a position where all he knows is what quantum mechanics tells him, right? Because then God has to be telepathic. He has to not only be paying attention to his special particle on the moon at that moment, but he has to be paying attention to everything that's happening everywhere else in the universe because he has to 
switch this particle to be green at the exact moment that our detector here in this room fires red. Okay, so this is the sort of power which Einstein says, God doesn't work like that. And the root of the problem is the same as what we had last time. That if you're stuck with just having these probabilities, then that's the kind of picture you could be led to by quantum mechanics. Okay, so now we're back to young Einstein and Einstein in his later years. Um, so the first question, well, the second question was the one we did first. What did Einstein think about quantum mechanics? And now we have an answer to that. Quantum mechanics is incomplete, says Einstein. What that means is that quantum mechanics does not give us a complete description of reality. The chances are not all there is to know about the world. So now we're still left with this other question, the historical question that uh, we asked at the beginning. So what do we make of this? Did Einstein really become unwilling to accept the new ideas of quantum mechanics in his later years? Did he really become that conservative uh, person who wasn't willing to recognize that, there's a lot of, that there were new ideas in quantum mechanics, which is how his colleagues were portraying him? Ah, so here's the prime amongst his colleagues who made this, who made this charge against Einstein. So here we have Niels Bohr, who himself won a Nobel Prize the very year after Einstein did in 1922. And he's famous for making many contributions to quantum mechanics between 1911 and 1962. Um, so if you were making a list of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, Einstein and Bohr would presumably be up there near the very top of your list. So here's what Bohr says about Einstein. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I, I wanna give you a flavor of what Bohr says about Einstein, but we're not gonna, unlike Einstein, the Einstein quotes, we're not gonna worry too much about the details here. I'm just gonna give you a sketch of what's going on. Okay, so here's what Bohr says in response to the 1935 paper we just talked about. It is decisive to recognize that however far the phenomena transcend the scope of classical physical, expl classical physical explanation, the account of all evidence must be expressed in classical terms. The argument is simply that by the word experiment, we refer to a situation where we can tell others what we have done and what we have learned, and that therefore, the account of the experimental arrangement and of the results of the observations must be expressed in unambiguous language with suitable application of the terminology of classical physics. Okay, so you get the same idea being repeated there a few times, which is that, What's important is that you can explain using the ideas from classical physics just the experimental apparatus, right? Just the detector that we had in our picture. Okay, so there's lots of dispute among historians and others about how to properly read, uh, properly read Bohr. So I'm gonna give you one way of reading just the little piece that I gave you to give you a sense of what he thought about Einstein's ideas. So Bohr thinks that quantum mechanics is complete. And his reason for thinking that is because he gives us a complete description of the detectors using classical concepts. And that's all he's requiring of the theory. Okay, so let's compare that to what Einstein said. And so here's what Bohr would say about Einstein's experiment. Okay, so this is, um, so, so here's the setup, right? So, we, uh, so remember we have the probabilities that quantum mechanics, uh, the quantum mechanics is giving us. Um, so the first move that Bohr would make, if we're thinking about our detector that we set up here in this room in London, that he would say, look, these probabilities are giving us a description of the detector. So what the probabilities are telling us is that there's a one in two chance that the detector is gonna flash red, and there's a one in two chance that the detector is gonna flash green. Okay, so I moved them here because before I was talking with Einstein, as if, what quantum theory was telling us about was about the particles themselves, right, and the properties they had. And Bohr doesn't want to make that move. Bohr says no. All quantum mechanics is telling us about is the detectors. Okay. So the other thing that's really important if you're going to be insistent about detectors is you can't really say anything about this particle on the moon unless you go to the moon and put a detector there, right? Because that's what quantum mechanics is about, according to Bohr, is giving, it's giving predictions or descriptions of the detector. So if there's no detector, there's nothing for quantum mechanics to tell us. Okay, so we're gonna put, have to put a detector on the moon, and then quantum mechanics is gonna tell us about, um, about the chances. 
but that's not the biggest change. Now we have nothing here in the middle anymore. And Bohr, I think, is happy with that. Okay, so once you get to the point of saying quantum mechanics is a complete theory because it gives us a complete description of what's going to happen to our detectors whenever we do the experiment, then you no longer have any description of what's happening here in the middle. You don't even have any two particles anymore. Remember the story I told at the beginning about setting up our experiment, where we had our two particles and they interacted together in the beginning and then shot off in different directions. You don't even have, you don't even have that. You just have who knows what in, 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 the, uh, in the middle. Um, so Bohr thought this was okay because he thought that the point of physics was to give us classical descriptions of the things that we could understand, which were the detectors. And then he was happy to leave aside as being unknown by humans. I don't know what he thought about God, but at least by humans, in our human theories that we can create, what's in the middle. Okay, so back to this question. Did Einstein really become unwilling to accept the new ideas of quantum mechanics in his later years? If Bohr's right, then a radical new consequence of quantum mechanics is that physics cannot always describe reality from this God's eye point of view that Einstein was insisting on. Um, but I think the important thing is that's if Bohr is right. And remember, there was a big disagreement between Einstein and Bohr about who exactly was right. Um, and a disagreement which in some respects still persists to the present day. So I think here's a better way to describe what was happening in this situation with Einstein and the reception he was getting with his colleagues uh, in his later years of his life. Um, so I don't think it's, bad, it's, it's good to talk about a willingness or unwillingness to accept new concepts. Um, but what there really was was a disagreement about two things. One was whether quantum mechanics necessitates a new picture of reality. Uh, and the second one is what physicists should do next. And so this is where they disagree, right? So Bo Einstein says what physicists should do next, that they should find a new a theory to replace quantum mechanics um, because quantum mechanics isn't giving us a complete description of what there is in the world. Okay, so there was a picture of reality he had in the background there. Whereas Bohr says the opposite. What physicists should do is they should stick with quantum mechanics and they should abandon their hopes for a more complete picture of reality because that's the new thing about quantum mechanics. The new concept is that there's nothing more to be said about reality. Okay, so I, I think that this is a better way of putting it, is that there, there's a disagreement, and then both Einstein and Bohr put forward different arguments for their points of view, um, but uh, there are different ways in, each, in which each of those points of view are uh, involving new concepts and, and are, are radical. Okay, so, this is, so if this was a a talk about Einstein and Bohr and their debate, I would leave it there. But this is a talk where, as I said, I want Einstein to get the last word in here. It was unfortunate in his lifetime uh, for the history of the subject that he didn't get the last word in and that De Bohr outlived him by quite some time. So there was a lot of time for Bohr to get his ideas forward, but Einstein had already died. So here I'm gonna let uh, Einstein speak. Bohr is a Talmudic philosopher who doesn't give a hoot for reality, which he regards as a hobgoblin of the naive. Okay, so, um, so that's Einstein's criticism of Bohr. And what he's talking about there is Bohr's question mark in the middle. Einstein's not happy with the question mark in the middle. He wants a theory, a better theory, which is going to tell us what there is in the middle. Okay, so let me summarize that. Einstein believed that quantum mechanics was incomplete because quantum mechanics delivers chances like a dice game and not information about what actually occurs like God would have if God were sitting down at the casino or playing a game of snakes and ladders. Einstein's colleagues criticized Einstein for being unwilling to change his thinking to adapt to the new concepts introduced by quantum mechanics. And then Einstein criticizes colleagues back as is wont to happen. So here's an I'm gonna give him another criticism. They simply do not see what sort of risky game they are playing with reality, right? That, they, that if you allow the dice game to stand and think that's all there is to quantum mechanics, then you're going to have to give up on this concept of reality. So as I said, Einstein and Bohr were two of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. And there, one thing that they did agree on was that quantum mechanics makes accurate predictions. And what that meant was that, uh, that quantum mechanics was a reliable basis and continues to be a reliable basis for new technologies, 
uh, and for decision making um, uh, about all sorts of practical matters. So they weren't disagreeing about the practical utility of quantum mechanics. But they did disagree strongly about the picture of reality that's given by quantum mechanics and about the right direction for future research in physics. Uh, so I think that in that respect, this disagreement between Einstein and his colleagues uh, is uh, actually not unique. There are often disagreements of this nature at the cutting edge of any field of scientific research. And there are the sorts of disagreements where there are fundamental issues about where to go next and about what your theory tells you about what the world is like. But behind that, there's agreement that the theory does a lot of things very well, and those things allow you to, uh, and what it does well, allows you to make predictions, do experiments, develop new technologies, and to make policy decisions based on scientific evidence. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, so much. Right, and, and it came from, th his dad dissatisfaction in his later years came from thinking that general relativity got something right too, right? So when you asked him what he thought the new theory should do, it should have, gra it, should, 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 <laughs> it, should, it should incorporate some of his other great exp uh, discoveries as well, right? So you're right that there's a bit of that aspect uh, to, his, to his criticisms as well. Um, as far as, rent, as, as probabilities go, that is one more modern view on quantum mechanics, yes. that there is an irreducible randomness. Uh, and so um, that's also a, a, an avenue that means you have to add more to the descriptive apparatus of basic quantum mechanics, but it's another way of going that was different from what Einstein had in mind. Cool. Um, so somebody earlier was over here. Yeah. Stephen Hawking once said, God does not only play dice, but he knows way to throw so that you cannot see them. Ah, <laughs> yes, I think that is an excellent uh, update on. Uh, so in the years since uh, Einstein was thinking about this, of course, uh, thousands of physicists have tried to pin down experimentally in uh, more specifically what's going on, right? And, and so it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. And so this, is, I think, was maybe partly what Stephen Hawking had in, had in mind, that, uh, that, maybe, that uh, suspicion that God is hiding something from us by making it so hard to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, yes? From my point of view, I think that God wouldn't know what is going on in this one point. Well, I guess I believe that God does know that he is omniscient. After all, he created the world. Yeah, so you know what? You're on the same page as Einstein there, right? So um, I think the point you're talking about is that he couldn't tell whether it was green or red or whatever. Right, okay, so good. So this, this point here, right? So I said, look, if God can only know the probabilities, then uh, this is what's going to happen, right? But you're on the same page as Einstein there. Einstein thought that assuming that God only knew those chances, only knew the probabilities, was the wrong answer. Right? So that, that's not the right way to understand what's going on. And that's part of why he thought that there had to be a, has to be a better theory than quantum mechanics, which gives us a complete description, which is the sort of description that God would, must have. Right? Yeah, well, so you're on the same page as Einstein. I really don't you know, believe that that's one of my core <laughs> okay. Yes? What's, uh, what's the current thought on the nature of reality Like in, in the sense that, like Einstein had a firm belief in reality was uh, real, probably. Right. <laughs> and, and more was more of, well, we don't really know what reality is, but we know the effects of reality. Right, okay, good. So, um, so that, that's a question that is still a question that's being debated. Uh, and physicists have different points of view on that question, and certainly philosophers have different points of view on that question too, right? Because it's a question about, given the science we have, what does it tell us about what the world is like? Does it tell us anything about what the world is like? Okay, so um, in part what you have represented by Einstein and Bohr are two very different ideas about what the goal of science is, right? So, um, uh, so there's that aspect where they have different ideas about what the goal is, um, and then there's the other question you're pushing to, right? Which is, um, okay, so what's the right answer then, right? So, so what can quantum mechanics really tell us about the way the world is? Um, so we've gotten, I think, closer to answering some, we've ruled out some options, right? So we were talking about one of the options that got ruled out. Um, so, God, so the most simple picture that Einstein presented where God can't be telepathic, there's got to be something wrong with that picture, okay? So I think this is more the kind of, information that we're getting is we're ruling out possibilities. Okay, so that, that, that's kind of the best we can do at this point, but there's still uh, gonna be, always going to be questions about what the proper goal of science is and how far you can get with it. So at, so at the moment, Einstein would still say that quantum mechanics would be incomplete, probably? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, uh, yes, certainly. So th that kind of completion project, well, so um, there's an interesting question about how you would complete quantum mechanics, which I didn't get into. Right, so there's some really, uh, the most obvious strategies you'd have turn out not to work, in part because of this, the uh, experimental results that have come in. But Einstein wasn't really interested in the most obvious ways of doing it. He wanted the tough way, right? So he wanted something that did justice to gravity as well. So he had in mind a sort of grander view of making big changes to quantum mechanics, not just adding in more variables, say. 
right? So adding in more variables doesn't work, but something more uh, ambitious might. Um, yes? So from, from what you've said tonight, it sounds like Einstein was alone in having these feelings about quantum mechanics. Was there anyone else who shared Einstein's perspective of the original founders of the theory? Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. So, um, so yes, there were there there were certainly people who shared Einstein's feelings. So I think I'm thinking of Schrodinger, somebody who was uh, more sympathetic to Einstein than others were. Um, there's uh, the, the physicist David Bohm, in some respects, was very sympathetic to what Einstein wanted to do, although they didn't agree on some of the details. But the, the, there were people who um, were there was a diversity of opinion. Um, but what had happened was, I think in part because quantum mechanics was so useful, right? So, uh, and it was so, succe so successful in describing experiments that some of these problems were kind of swept under the rug, right? So I said, okay, well, that's not that interesting. Let's just go use this great theory to make another, to do another great experiment, right? Um, so uh, I think that for those reasons, maybe Bohr's opinions about how it worked gained some prominence in the, in, the science, in the physics community, but there were other people who, who were uh, uneasy about it, like Einstein was. Uh, yeah, at the back. So the letters that Bohr and Einstein both were sending were to Schrodinger, were they? Aha, uh -huh, yes. Which was also a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Right? That's right, yes. And so he sided, I was going to ask which side he sided on, so in the end, you really sided on Einstein? Um, he was more sympathetic to Einstein okay. than, than the others were. Um, yeah, so especially in the early days, there were lots of options on the table, right? Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to remember, though. They yeah. both to him, were they not? It's, oh, yeah, so one of the, one of the, one of the letters complaining was to was yeah, to was, I thought it was both from two, both of the letters to um, I, I cannot be able to find it, but yeah, okay, y yes. Um, so Schrodinger wasn't one of the ones making the criticisms. Um, the maybe surprising criticism was from that I had at the beginning was from Max Born. So in some respects, Born and Einstein, uh, at least Einstein wrote to Born throughout his life. Um, so that they they were they were close. Um, but uh, um, so maybe that was that criticism from Born was kind of surprising that I had at the beginning. Yes. There are two theories that explain uh, it, quantum mechanics. One is a modern world where the physical reality does exist, and the other is the transactional interpretation of that theory, where you have advanced waves, like the, the uh, Maxwellian uh, uh, return waves and, and advanced waves, and that they can explain why, you know, the, the diffraction patterns and all that kind of stuff. It's very fascinating. Yeah, so what's, what's fascinating about this is probably that you keep getting new possibilities put on the table, right? So both of the um, views that you... Uh, well, the, 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 the many worlds kind of view goes back a ways, but um, there's, all, there's, all, there's still new views being put on the table about this, and new ways of trying to figure out what picture of reality we get out of quantum theory, right? So there, there's, there's always new, new options being put on the table. Yeah. Uh, do you think Einstein and Bohr are talking about two different realities? For example, uh, let's just take the Dalian argument in this, where there's an actual reality which is completely provable, and there's a true reality which is provable to an extent. So perhaps Einstein might be talking about a, reality, a, 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 a physically real, provable aspect of reality. And perhaps quantum mechanics is talking about there are some aspects which are provable and other things uh, is just, yeah. Right, so what can, we, what can human beings know about the world, right? Is one of the questions that's, that's yeah. going to uh, push you in different directions about what you think the goal of physics is, right? So, if, so Einstein thinks that, uh, that what we should be aiming for is what God is about the world. Right? We shouldn't be, no half measures here. We should be going for what God knows about the world. Um, and so that, that really shaped his, his view of how, of how physics works. And, and that wasn't uh, Bohr's view of how, of how things worked. Um, so that was one point on which they disagreed. Yeah? I didn't do well in philosophy 101. <laughs> but I think you call that a Greek philosopher, Plato, set up a model where where humans or human minds were down in the cave. And they were unable to get a clear or true or real perception of what the world was like, but they thought they had. Uh -huh. Because of their, their immediate observations, and that was their world. Now, I can't help but think that, that we, are, we are still groping and maybe we haven't found the way yet to get above the surface. I, uh, 
Yeah, so it sounds like you're more sympathetic to Bohr than to, than to, than to Einstein and thinking about, uh, and uh, so in a way, if, you, if you're looking at the, what the shadows are on the wall of the cave, you're, you're, and you're thinking about what the detectors are telling us, right? And, and, so, and, and maybe you're also with, with Hawking there in, in being worried that maybe God is hiding things from us, right? So that there's gonna be limitations to what we can figure out as human beings. Um, yeah, so that, that's one uh, motivation for, uh, for Bohr's approach. At the very back. Ah, uh, okay, so that's a good question. That's the part I was suppressing, right? So that's the part that the mathematical models that you get uh, from quantum mechanics and the equations in quantum mechanics are going to tell you. So I was also suppressing the bit where I told you what exactly the system was. So what quantum mechanics is, is it is a theory that gives you a mathematical model for taking the information about what kind of system you have and spitting out the probabilities. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, if you take the moon into account, too. Yes, it's a closed system. Um, so, one of the things, of course, that, uh, especially since Einstein put this type of experiment on the table, and even more so after these, experiment, uh, these proposed experiments by Bell, is that experimentalists wanted to actually do them. Right? So in practice, to actually do these experiments is really tricky because um, there's lots of interference from all these other things that you don't care about, which aren't your particle. Right? So if, if there are other things in the world that are knocking your particle around, then you're not going to get the uh, prediction that quantum mechanics says you will. So what kind of conditions um, do you for uh, systems? Ah, so that's a really complicated question. Uh, you're going to need to have a very sophisticated set of uh, laboratory set up where what you're trying to do is exclude anything that could be interfering, any sort of forces or any type of matter, anything that could be, that could be affecting the system. Um, so some of these experiments have been done, yes. Um, but it, was a, it took a while to do it because it was uh, technologically very difficult. And that was also part of the problem. There's a theoretical problem in the experimental one. So, so really what is needed is a super Einstein who will create a new theory which will have quantum mechanics as a limiting case the way that Newtonian physics, uh, Newtonian mechanics is a limiting case of Einstein's theories. Yeah, yeah. so that's the and kind of picture that Einstein people had. just try to prove whether Einstein is right or wrong, they're not thinking big enough. Ah, that's what Einstein thought, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's an important point, right? And, and this is what Einstein had in mind. Was the, uh, Einstein was ambitious, right? He had already, by this point in his career, put a number of, well, one Nobel Prize winning project, and then two other things which he didn't even win the Nobel Prize for, which are now some of the, founda which are the foundations of physics. Right? So Einstein wasn't thinking small about, well, maybe we just need to add three or four more variables that we're not taking into account. Um, that's not the way Einstein thought. Einstein thought, look, there's big principles here that we're missing. In particular, he knew, as I said, that gravity has to come into the picture too. Right? So yeah, so, we, so what, maybe what we need is somebody to come along and not just tinker with quantum mechanics, but to figure out the quantum gravity problem, which would be great. He wanted the unified field theory, didn't he? Fixed up? Well, yes, and, this, and so that, that was the approach that he took, and he couldn't make it work out, right? So, um, so you're working on it. Did I say I'm a historian and a philosopher? So, yeah. That's where you start. Yeah. There is another quotation, uh, I don't know where, from where, and that Bohr uh, listened to a lecture by some top class physicist to explain some problem. And uh, uh, his, uh, Bohr's answer, you know, to this person, whether this could explain the problem, was that, I don't think so. Your uh, theory is not crazy enough. <laughs> Where the words, <laughs> and I don't remember when. <laughs> yes, maybe that's what we need. Uh, one last question. To what extent would the Hadron Collider ah. come to bear in terms of proving or disproving 
one aspect or the other, one model, the other model, Neil versus Bohr. It's unfortunate that they are not around to have been able to use that in an experimental way. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Or maybe yeah, so you know what? It's a, yeah, it's, so I, I intentionally stopped the story er, early on in history. But what, what happened after this is not only that you have a lot of different interpretations of quantum mechanics on the table, but the, the field moved on, right? And so this is the basic quantum mechanics, but at least physicists solved the problem of how to introduce special relativity into quantum theory. And then that was the beginning of the standard model, which is the part that the, of the physics that the Higgs boson is part of, right? So now there's a whole big theory that um, was developed all after Einstein died. Um, and so that was the theory that was being tested in, uh, in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so it's not going to have any direct bearing on these sorts of questions, except that they're still there in the background, right? So we have more experimental evidence, but we already knew that the theory was really good at predictions. But we don't, what we don't know is what the theory means, right? What it's telling us about what the world is like. So that's still up there as a question. Thank you very much.